Hello, everyone. Welcome to Heather TV. I'm so excited to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Richard Hagland, to you today. Richard, thanks so much for joining us. Hello, it's wonderful to be here from sunny Minneapolis. It's cold but sunny here. <laughs> That's what you're saying. You have tons of snow right now. Uh, we had, just the other day, we had over 12 inches of snow here in Minneapolis. Oh, my. Wow. It's actually warmer in Bulgaria than it is in Minneapolis. I think everywhere is warmer than Minneapolis right now. <laughs> Okay, so Richard, I'm really excited to, to have you here, and the reason being is because we have a real exciting uh, concert coming up where we're, my quartet, Fusion, is going to be playing Richard's String Quartet Number 1, The States of Consciousness. And uh, it's a very wonderful piece, and I'm really uh, looking forward to talking to you about this because it's... Um, it, it's different, it's unique, it's beautiful, and it is um, touching in such a way, uh, uh, how can we say, I mean, it's called the states of consciousness. So, um, so it's really, really exciting to talk about. So before we get into that, actually, I want to just kind of get a little bit more of your personal background. So uh, tell me, how old were you when you were bitten by the music bug? That's wonderful. So you were really pretty young when you were bitten by the music bug. really pretty awesome and I, I think it's wonderful as a musician to explore different styles and different genres because it actually makes you a better musician if you have an open mind and, and explore the different styles. Right and the other thing that I always express you know the, the different genres but mm -hmm. just the universal connection that music has with all of us. Um, you know I've conducted all over the world now and sometimes I'm in situations where I can not Yeah. Um, this, this connection that we all share, and I, you know, I, I can't think of a culture that's devoid of music. I, I've been looking for one. I've been trying to find one. But even Tibetan monks that take a vow of absolute silence still sing and use prayer bowls to create sound. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I think that's interesting. 
Yes, absolutely. That, that could be a whole nother topic of discussion. Definitely. And, and that's something that intrigues me as well as the connection and the creation process, because I think that's something that we all share as humans is the desire to, to create. Well, and you know, it's, I've been looking into this even beyond humans. Uh, a colleague of mine in New York created a CD um, for cats and dogs that calms them down while their owners are gone. Uh -huh. And there's, there's something that's maybe even beyond humans that music right. does to just different organisms, whether it be a dog or a cat. I, I don't know how extensive it is, but that's something interesting to explore as well. Absolutely, yes, I would, I would agree 100%. For me, I, I see it as vibrational energy, and that vibrational energy impacts um, and affects basically everything. You know, the, the, do the animals are sensitive to it, we're sensitive to it, so, yeah. So that's, that's what kind of led to my first piece, Heather, um, which was called Altered States, and the Altered States of Consciousness that I think I might have sent to you, it, it depicts 13 different states. And each state, whether it be anxiety, I think well, the 13 that I used were anxiety, daydream, delirium, out-of-body experience, fear, religious experience, uh, mania, hypnosis, uh, panic, sexual pleasure, sleep, wakefulness, and then finally coma. And of those 13 states, um, it was very improvisatory for the performer to explore. But what I did with the string quartet was to make it basically just four different states, but I didn't name them. I mm -hmm. specifically didn't want to name the four states in the quartet because I wanted the performer to experience their own version of it. So Richard, what was your inspiration for the states of consciousness? So that first piece that I created was very improvisatory and it was open-ended of these 13 different states. So what I wanted to do was to take a string quartet and you know, a symphony is typically divided into four movements. And so I wanted to create a string quartet with four movements, um, but I wanted each of the four movements to have a different feeling or a different state of consciousness depicted. But I didn't want to list it. I wanted the, the listener to decide whatever they wanted to decide. It's pretty obvious that the last movement is hard to be melancholy while you listen to the last movement. Right. Um, but the other three are in the, the third movement is definitely a different feeling than the last movement. And each of the four movements is different. And then the last movement was actually the first movement I performed. Or rather, not performed, but I composed. I composed the last movement while I was in Kiev, um, cover conducting for a recording session with the Ukrainian National Symphony. And I had a lot of downtime, and I just got to work on the last movement. And believe it or not, the last movement was inspired by sound and music, traditional folk music that I heard in Bulgaria. Because the Bulgarian music does a lot of 7-8, mm -hmm. and it has a, an interesting feel to it, an interesting dance-like um, lilt to a lot of the folk music. So it was just a simple little tune that I came up with, and I just, it's not traditionally harmonized, it's not traditionally, um, it's not a folk melody, it's just something that I came up with. Just yeah. It's total through composed. So it's, it's, I wanted to have that just be an upbeat, lively, um, dance-like uh, movement. Mm -hmm. So then I constructed the first movement next. And the first movement, my dad was an architect, and it still would be a great idea of form and structure, especially in regards to building. And so this idea of form and structure is carried through into a lot of things that I've composed. I've composed a lot of pieces for percussion ensembles, uh, for using you know non-pitched instruments, where mm -hmm. the whole piece of music is based on instruments that have no definite pitch. Um, so what I did is I took the string quartet, which obviously has definite, almost every piece you listen to is extreme structure or pitch, and I just took that away to the bare open strings. So. What I did was I kind of constructed the first movement. Well, how can I construct a movement that only deals with open strings and still has some kind of an architecture to it? And then I used this one idea of the glissando as a juxtaposition to the open strings because the glissando en encompasses all the pitches mm -hmm. within a certain set. So mm -hmm. what you hear is this construction. 
construction and an arc of beginning to end, and it kind of takes a little surprise in the middle. Uh -huh. so, so that's that was the whole construct of the first movement. I love minimalism. I've conducted a lot of music um, by Steve Wright, by John Adams, although he doesn't consider himself a minimalistic composer. Um, I love that kind of that kind of music, but I took it to a little bit different level. I approached the I approached that first movement with um, kind of a, a minimalist, but yet not minimalist approach. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yes, exactly. But, um, they say like talking about music is like dancing about architecture. So I, uh, you know, it's hard for me to articulate some of these things. So that that was how the first movement came up. The second and third movements came on after I had completed the the last and the first movement. And again, I was looking for something different. Um, the second movement has a definite tension to it that's finally released in the end. Mm -hmm. And then the third movement has a very melancholy. Um, feeling to it. So the four movements are definitely, you know, they could stand in and of themselves, mm -hmm. I guess. They're very short, um, so because the whole piece is, you know, just a few minutes long. So, but I think together as a, as a you know, first, second, third, fourth movement, it's interesting because it spans four different um, temperaments, if you will. Yeah, exactly. And so let's continue talking about that a little bit and go back to that fourth movement. Um, how long had it been since you visited Bulgaria to the point that you wrote this? Oh, wow. Um, I have been to Bulgaria since, um, let's see here, I think my last time in Bulgaria, I'd have to look it up again, but it's been several years now. Um, I feel bad about that because I love Bulgaria. Um, I love Gavrovo a lot. I've conducted there twice, uh, two different concerts, and I, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, I've also visited Varna and conducted the Varna Symphony, um, and uh, also been to Pleven, and uh, it's just, it's a great place to visit, um, but it's been several years, so, but Bulgarian folk music is something that's in my rotation of, of music that I play. I uh -huh. love playing in the background at parties here in Minneapolis, um, okay. get togethers, and the people say, what is that, or yeah. what, that's really unique sound, and, yeah, yeah. and it's just, it's got a festive, you know, happy um, sound to it. Um, mm -hmm. So I collected a few CDs when I was there last, but I don't know. I, I would have to look up and see how many years it was. I guess this the, I wrote the last movement, um, well, two and a half years ago now. Okay. Um, so that was, you know, quite a while before I got the rest of the composition done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I asked because uh, um, because obviously the Bulgarian music made an impression on you. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, uh, definitely stayed with you to the point that it inspired you to write a piece um, in 7-8, <laughs> a movement in 7-8. So. Yeah, well, my first time in Bulgaria, I remember distinctly in 99, um, listening to my, the very first thing I heard was an accordion player outside the hotel where we stayed at in Varna, and he did this wicked, wicked accordion uh, virtuosic kind of playing, and it was all on sevens and nines and thirteens, and the, the structure was so fascinating to me. Um, but that's just, you know, that was probably my first impression. I can I can remember it very well, yeah. listening uh, first time to that that wonderful sound. Yeah. Well, I'm very excited uh, to play your piece because. With the quartet that we have, me being American, the cellist is American, and the two Bulgarian. So it's a fusion of cultures, countries, and uh, people. And we're going to be playing your piece on our first concert, which is very exciting, because your music is the same. You, uh, it's a fusion of Bulgarian folk music into a kind of a class classical structure, I would say, of um, music. So it's really exciting. And uh, okay, so then let's move to the first movement. I have to give you my impression of the first movement when we, I, I love the first movement. I would highly suggest this for any string quartet, uh, any musicians that uh, are looking for a, a piece to play, I would, I would highly recommend your piece, States of Consciousness. And the first movement especially, because like you said, it takes 
the intonation completely out. As long as your strings are in tune, <laughs> you know, um, you really get to focus and hone in on rhythm, on playing together, on uh, articulation, and it's it's absolutely beautiful because it, it really tightens up a string quartet very quickly. I would say. Well, that's good. I guess the uh, quartet's going to be available through your website, right? Yes, absolutely. So anybody that would that would like to, to purchase can definitely do so. Um, all all the parts and the score, and I, I would highly suggest it. <laughs> the the I first. Would love to have it played as many places as possible. I mean, um, of course, when you give birth to something like this, it could either just sit on a shelf, or the, that's the problem with music is it, it could be recorded, I guess. And that, but there's something about live performances with music that just do make a difference. I mean, we can access the best CDs in the world, but people still go to live concerts no. there's, because of the energy. There's a Absolutely. Whole, whether it be Sting or um, whether it be the Berlin Philharmonic or whether it be a, um, the Fusion String Quartet, yeah. it's different. It's different to hear them live than in a recording. And Absolutely. There's energy in the room. Oh yeah, huge difference. Exactly. I mean. We, um, and it's a connection. It's a connection of the musicians and the audience at that time. And it only happens with live music. You can't turn the CD on and feel a connection with musicians like you do in, a, you know, in a live performance. <clears throat> yeah. 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 So the second movement. Um, is there any specific inspiration that you have for the second movement? The second movement goes through a very um, sub. Uh, it's kind of a very subtle chord progression, and it's it's you know in in school in when we study music, or at least I was very shocked at how when we took a piece of music that I actually liked and started deconstructing it and and dissecting it, um, sometimes some of the it became a little bit too analytical for me looking at a piece sometimes when we dissect things and look at it, you know, well, this is such and such, uh, this is a Neapolitan six chord, or this is, look at how he treats this specific four chord, and, and it takes away some of the beauty. I don't really want to tell you what I was doing as far as a, from a theoretical standpoint, but what it is, what the intention was behind what I was doing theoretically was to create a great degree of tension, and but not not the tension that is so displeasing and so you know making the audience plead for it to stop kind of tension. Rather, just a very like a little spark or ignition that that finally culminates in the release of this tension at the end of the second moment. So and so these little sparks that are exchanged between the four different players are kind of like a, um, I don't know, almost like a pinball effect, mm -hmm. where they, you know, they kind of spark gain off one another, and then finally just release at the end. I mean, we all experience different kinds of tensions, and then finally some kind of uh, release or epiphany or whatever you want to call it, and mm -hmm. so that was, the, that was kind of the, the intent behind that movement. Um, I could break down the chord structure and how I germinated know each each evolution what happens is each player as they shift an accent on their notes the chord that is maintained by the constant momentum of everyone playing changes mm -hmm. and so you you hear this very subtle shift of chord structures but really what the audience is experiencing is some kind of attention and then release is, is basically the simplest way to, to talk about this mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty intense movement. And again, as far as uh, playing, it's excellent uh, um, concentration. You have to have excellent focus and concentration. And uh, the same thing, articulation and, and the musicians working together to line everything up. Because it has to be lined up. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of back to maybe somewhat influenced by marching band experience. And I know that's probably weird um, for, to think about, but when I played at the University of Minnesota Drumline, and I also taught drumline at Wayzata High School, and, and uh, you know, it was all about getting this absolute precision, getting a group of, of musicians, percussionists, mm -hmm. to play absolutely together. Where you know, 
we would do one thing where we would just do one hit, absolutely, you know, one just one strike of the instrument, absolutely together. And it's, it sounds kind of simplistic. Believe it or not, if you have 25, 30 people to do an exact attack together, it, it's not that easy. Right, right. Um, so maybe there's some influence there from marching band on that, but there's also influence of uh, Schoenberg, and there's also influence of Steve Reich again, and John Adams, and there's all sorts of different influences there. Um, but that precision is definitely uh, necessary in both the first, well, in all music precision is necessary, but it would be glaringly obvious if somebody got off on the second movement. Oh, yeah. Two, yeah. Even, ju even just by a split second, because it's lined up so exactly and precisely. And one thing, if, um, if any of any of the listeners go ahead and, and, and does purchase this piece and, and practices it. One thing to be careful of is that the forte pianos, you cannot crescendo into them, right, Richard? You have to be like, really, you stay really, really quiet. And that for string players, a lot of times right before a forte piano, this bow strokes before that forte piano gets bigger and louder because you're anticipating the forte piano. But what has to happen here is you have to stay very um, quiet and that forte piano just has to pop out, like you said, a spark. So for every player to do that exactly right, it's, it's very important. And when it's done right, it's really pretty amazing. Uh, and, and also, you can't take time. I mean, a lot of times, string players, they get to that forte piano, they take more bow, and they start to slow down. But it has to be exactly, like you said, you know, drum line, just going. So. Yep, precision. It's interesting how much time you have to spend in rehearsals um, with orchestras, whether it be a string orchestra or a big symphony orchestra, just getting everyone's bow in the right place and at the right time. I mean, it's, I don't think people realize symphony or like really great, what makes really great symphony orchestras is that their unity that they yeah. have. I mean, if you watch, if you watch the Boston Symphony play an absolute pianissimo, it's just absolutely magical. Um, but quartets, you know, the, the quartet, if everyone's in the same part of the bow, the same articulation, um, it's magical. And if yeah. it's not, then it's, yeah, 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 and um, I find um, what I find is that the actual if everything is metronomically accurate and you're very precise, that actually the some people you know actually the musicality is more intense. You know, of course, there's some places where we have rubat rubatos and things like that, but what I find is when it's absolutely right, then that musicality can really just uh, it just clicks. It's it's magic. Um, well, if your heartbeat is irregular, you're usually not too healthy. Yeah. <laughs> I like to think of, you know, if you're working out, of course, your heart rate is accelerating. If you're resting, your your heart rate is slower, slowed down. But if you, I mean, we all have a pulse. I was, I was, uh, that's, that's my dog, Wolfgang. Hi, Wolfgang. <laughs> he, uh, he, he wanted to be heard there. Yes, exactly. But, um, I, you know, if, if everyone has a pulse, and not only everybody has a pulse, but everything has a pulse. So even if you break things down into, you know, the microscopic level, there's atoms spinning for everything. And I'm no scientist, but there's a rhythm to absolutely everything in the planet. And the planet itself has a, has a rhythm. So for me, rhythm is so fundamental towards everything. So that's why... Totally and melodically, this piece isn't is structured as much as it is rhythmically based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes that that makes complete sense. <laughs> and as far as the third movement, what I absolutely love about the third movement is it's always alive. It's always living. It's always changing. So anybody that performs this, it's their own version of it. Um, it it's com it's completely living music, which is incredible. Yeah, I, I wanted to give a movement that, you know, every, the rest of it is so highly intensely structured, especially the first and second movement. So when I was doing the third movement, I wanted to kind of release from that structure um, and still have a melancholy kind of attitude, but to let the performers improvise a lot of that movement on their own and give their own voice to the piece. Um, when I can do a lot of melodic improvising until... You know, I really got into jazz. 
because we're so trained as classical musicians to, you know, to learn to play every note perfectly, every, you know, every nuance exactly how it's written. And then to ask classical musicians to improvise, they're often like, what do I do? I, I, I know. I feel, you feel naked or yeah. you just feel out of a fish out of water. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, but I think it's important because if you look at the Baroque era, I mean, classical musicians improvise all the time. They would improvise their own cadenza. They would improvise just on a theme. So you on Sebastian Bach would, you know, he would be given a theme and he would just improvise on the organ on that theme and just make it up on the, at the spot. Um, so the third moment is a tribute actually to Bach because in his uh, Well-Tempered Clavier, which is a training, basically training manual to learn how to play the keyboard, he explored all 12 keys, both major and minor, and he would, each piece, it starts out with a prelude in C major, and then he goes through the circle of fifths and just it explores all the different keys and, and makes pieces up as he goes through those different keys. So that third movement actually works its way through the circle of fifths, just as Bach did in his well-tempered clavier, but um, the, each performer has to give their own voice to the composition. And mm -hmm. I, my hope is, is that as as this piece gets performed by your group and others, I hope, is that players learn to listen to what each other is playing and actually feed off of that and not just not just be their own solo voice, but also communicate with music to each other in the, within that same context of mood and structure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really it's really amazing. I I I love your piece. The states of consciousness. And one thing I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about was the um, the states of consciousness, the effect on the brain. So, um, if I can read what you have here in the program notes, okay. And so, uh, this is written by you, right, Richard? So I could say this is by Richard. <laughs> In your program notes here, Richard, um, one thing I wanted to talk about, which because it is, it's uh, interesting to me, the, you have altered states of consciousness can be associated with artistic creativity. music, you 
you know, whether it be background or not, or something that we just focus on, it's it's affecting us in some way. Mm -hmm. So, again, what I wanted to do with these four different um, movements is, in fact, make people go to different places, and that's going to be individually different for each audience member. Um, so if they hate the piece, and they just they, they resist the piece, I'm still altering their consciousness by them not liking it, but I hope that they just keep open-minded and, and think about how music does affect them as they're listening to the piece, because it's kind of an awareness. So I think artistically, artistic creativity what we're doing as artists is we're trying to con express something that we can't otherwise express. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you're making me talk about music, and it's hard to talk about music. It's, it's, um, it, it, again, it's like dancing about architecture. So, yeah. um, but I, you know, all, all forms of artistic expression fascinate me for different reasons. Um, but uh, something about live music performance, it's just that one moment it's it's you know we can make a cd we can listen to that cd again but it's different um it's different than hearing it live for the first time and i'm so excited that you guys are doing the world premiere of this piece yay woohoo i'm too <laughs> that's very exciting yes i am i'm i'm very very excited about it and and uh so richard thank you so very much for you know for um, taking some time out of your busy schedule and doing this interview with me and um, to talk about your amazing piece and and um, thank you. <laughs> oh, well, it was absolutely my pleasure. Thanks so much. And uh, so, do you have any any last any last little bits you want to add about the state of consciousness or um, or anything in general? <laughs> Yes, uh, we're um, at, we're doing some Bulgarian pieces, Golominov, um, Golominov, uh, some Pipkov pieces, Pipkov, I have to pronounce it correctly, and uh, Piazzola, and I have to think what else we're putting on the program, Piazzola, Pipkov, Golominov, and your piece. So yeah, so it's really exciting because it's a it's a again a fusion of of, of music. So. Um, of different, of different cultures and styles. So, yeah. All right, Richard, thanks again. And so everyone, we're going to say uh, say goodbye for today and can't wait to um, have another Heather TV episode. But until then, remember, from Richard and myself, be true, be you, be.